Hello and welcome. In this lesson, we will continue our journey with capital gains tax. This lesson is again basic uh, level capital gains tax. So it is exactly the same thing uh, which you have seen at F6. Now, if you're watching this lecture for F6, that uh, is new to you. But if you have, if you're watching P6, that uh, then you have already seen this video at F6 level. All right. So we will continue our journey with uh, capital gains tax. And now let's move to our notes. I will just share the screen with you and let's look at the uh, capital gains tax format now. Here you go. I will share the screen with you. Now this is our capital gains tax format. If you can see here, it says asset sold. And uh, first of all, it says not qualifying for entrepreneur's leave. Now while making the uh, in, uh, a capital gains tax uh, pro forma, we will have to keep this asset separate. Uh, which assets? Assets which are qualifying for entrepreneurial leave and assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. Why is the reason of separating them? Because the uh, tax rate is different for both of them. In entrepreneurial leave, it is 10%, whereas in the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave, uh, the rate is either 18 or 28%. All right. So we'll take the sales first and incidental cost of sales and cost and enhancement expenditure the remaining one would be gain and these are the assets uh, gain on the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneur relief so 18 or 28 percent will be applied on that so we've made three columns so we'll put it into the third column this gain would go into the last column now asset number two it says qualifying for entrepreneur relief now these are the assets we will list down the assets here which are qualifying for entrepreneur relief so we'll take the sales of these assets, then incidental cost of sales and costs, and then enhancement expenditure. Now this gain would go into the second column. Now you, you can see that this gain is going into the separate column, uh, whereas the previous gain would, uh, has gone into the last column. And asset number three, current year loss. Now this one is a, a current year loss, it says. Uh, we'll take the sales if any loss is incurred on any asset. So we'll take the sales, uh, incidental cost of sales, cost and enhancement expenditure. Now, whatever the loss is, uh, as you can see the loss, now we can uh, set off the loss uh, against, uh, the, uh, against the assets, against these two assets. Uh, I've just moved the screen now, uh, just sit down. So this is the current year loss. Now we have option to set, it, set this loss against the, non, uh, against the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave and against the assets which are qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. Now the preference is shown on your screen. First preference is uh, to the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. So we'll set it, uh, set it off against the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave first. Then the, our second preference would be to set it off against the assets which are qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. So our second preference would be that if any loss is still remaining. All right. So that is our preference. After that, if you can see, the uh, capital losses brought forward, uh, if there are any capital losses from previous years, so we have brought it forward. Uh, now, again, the preference is against first, first against uh, not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. And if there is any remaining, then we will set it off against the uh, entrepreneurial leave, as it's, uh, which are qualifying for entrepreneurial leaves. And it says up to the amount, uh, up to the amount of annual exempt so uh, you can do it like uh, w whatever the loss is, you can set it off, but you cannot use the annual exemption amount as far as a uh, loss carried forward is concerned, loss brought forward is concerned. So you had a previous lo uh, year's loss of say 15,000 pounds and you can only set off 4,000 in current year. So you will leave the annual exempt amount so uh, that you can only maximum you can relief is up to the annual exempt amount up to the amount that annual exemption remains. All right. Now, after that, uh, this is chargeable gain. We will have to list down the chargeable gain. Now, we have listed both of them, uh, which is uh, first one is uh, not qualifying for entrepreneurial relief and the other one is qualifying for entrepreneurial relief. Less annual exemption. Now, we can deduct the annual exemption from these two. Again, uh, for as far as the annual exemption is concerned, again, our preference is First, from the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial leave, then and remaining, we will uh, deduct it out of the uh, assets which are qualifying for entrepreneurial leave. Right? 
Now these are the taxable gains and we have to pay tax on that. 18 and 28 percent in the assets which are not qualifying for entrepreneurial relief and 10 percent on the assets which are qualifying for entrepreneurial relief. So for as far as entrepreneurial relief is concerned there is no banding. So whichever band your asset is in uh, you, uh, you will still be paying at 10 percent. However uh, there will be 18 and 28 percent for basic and higher rate band if your asset is not qualifying for entrepreneurial relief. Right? If you come to page uh, next page, it is page 36 of uh, uh, the notes. You know, it, it might be different on your page, uh, on your notes. If you uh, if you download from the website, it might be different. This page number, uh, but th the data will be exactly the same, so you don't have to worry about it. All right. Now it says the chattels. Now, what are the chattels? Chattels is a tangible, movable property, and uh, uh, chattels could be of many sorts. Now, uh, chattel is a tangible movable property so it cannot be plant and machinery which we just fix it and we cannot move it so it must be tangible and it must be movable an intangible thing copyright is it a, is it a chattel no, it's not chattel because it should be tangible and it should be movable property like uh, ipad is a chattel if you say but it says uh, just beneath that wasting chattel is a chattel with useful life of less than 50 years if uh, a chattel has a less than 50 years life like this iPad it is a wasting chattel and how to calculate uh, the gain on wasting chattel it is exempt sale of wasting chattel it is exempt from CGT so we don't have to worry about it after that it says sale of chattel for less than 6000 pounds now this is only relevant for F6 it is not relevant for P6 although it is relevant but uh, you should know it it is not uh, you know you cannot expect to be it in the exam. Our F6 for F F6 it is very very important. The sale of chattel for less than six thousand pound, and if gain arises, if you sell the sale and, uh, and wasting, if if you sell an chattel, if you sell a chattel and you sell it for less than six thousand pounds, and there is a gain, then it would be exempt. However, if you sell it at loss, uh, which is you are sell it for less than six thousand pounds, uh, then you know the loss is calculated assuming if the loss sale was six thousand pounds so you sold it for four thousand pounds and you incurred a loss so you it will be assumed that you sold it for six thousand pounds not four thousand pounds so even if you sell it for four thousand pounds minimum you will show it as six thousand pounds so you will reduce the loss the loss cannot be changed into gain but the loss can maximum be reduced to zero the loss cannot be go cannot go into the negatives after that, if you sell it for more than six thousand pounds and there is a gain, the maximum gain would be three over five. Uh, so you can whatever the gain is, you can take the three over five maximum. However, if you sell it for more than six thousand pounds and if there is a loss, uh, if if there is a loss, it says uh, just beneath that, if you can see, uh, then normal CGT calculation would apply. And now, if you sell an asset, uh, if you sell a chattel, it says sale of chattel uh, where the capital allowances had been claimed, uh, then capital gain would be zero. So no pain, no gain, no gain, and no loss. So if an, on an, on any asset, if a capital allowance has been claimed, then for capital gains purposes, you will take the proceeds as the cost. So proceed will be equal to the cost. So no no gain, no loss. All right. After that, it says an intangible assets. You will always take depreciated value of intangible assets. So amortized value. There is no depreciation on intangible assets. There is something called amortization. So uh, we'll take amortized cost uh, of uh, intangible asset, and it would be on straight line basis. You will you can just read it from the notes. If you can pause this video, uh, I'll just move it forward. It is just for self study. All right. The next one is uh, principal private residence. Now, if you have a house, and if you have just one house, maybe, or if you have one than, more than one house, then you can select what is your principal house, what is your main house of living. Now, you can select what your main house. Now, if you have your main house and you have occupied this house, then you might be able to get principal private residence relief. All right. So, what would that be? Again, arising on sale of an individual's only or main residence. If you have only or main residence, say if you have, if you have three properties and you can say I had a property in London, Manchester and Birmingham, then I can say my uh, principal property is in Manchester, then if you sell that property, then you might be able to claim principal private residence relief. A 
again arising on sale of an individual's only or main pro uh, private residence, which is PPR, uh, exempt up to whatever the gain is. So we'll take the sales minus cost, that would be gain. And again, multiplied by period of occupation, multi uh, divided by total period of ownership. Say, for example, you bought it in 1990 and you sold it in 2016, so you owned it almost for 26 years, right? Now we'll have to see out of this 26 years, so we'll have to multiply by 26, multiply by 12, so how many months, whatever the months are, then we'll have to see how many months you actually occupied that. So a period of occupation divided by total period of ownership, multiplied by gain, all right? So that would be our exemption. Now as far as occupation is concerned, there is then something called actual occupation and there is other thing called deemed occupation. Now deemed just means assumed occupation. So HMRC says even you actually did not occupy your property, but we will think, we will assume it as occupied if any of the following conditions applied. We will see the deemed occupation in a while, but for now you can see the, uh, just read the notes below. When calculating the period of occupation, the last 18 months are always treated as period of occupation. Now last 18 months, while bef last 18 months before you sell the property, last 18 months will always be uh, considered as uh, occupied, even if you did, did not actually occupy it. All right? Uh, after that, it says, uh, some period of absence may also be considered as occupied, which is deemed occupation. Now, you actually did not occupy, but it will be deemed occupation, provided the period of absence was at some time was both uh, proceeded and followed by period of actual occupation. So deemed occupation will only apply if after that and before that you actually occupied the property. So deemed occupation will only apply in that case. Now what is deemed occupation? Uh, it is uh, just written beneath that. There are three conditions. First one is up to the three years of absence for any reasons. So you can say that I was absent for any reason. So 36 months you can take that up to three years. All right. So that would be uh, considered as actually occupied, whereas it is not actually, it is deemed occupied, so that three years for any reasons can be considered as uh, occupied. Any period spent abroad for employment, so whatever the period is, even if it is five years and you went for abroad, for, uh, abroad for employment, and here abroad means outside UK. So if you went for employment abroad for any period, that would be uh, occupation as well. Out of that it says up to four years of absence to live elsewhere due to the work. Now, uh, elsewhere means within the UK. If you live in the uh, Manchester and you went uh, from Manchester to uh, Edinburgh uh, for work, then uh, up to four years uh, that would be exempt and that would be considered as a deemed occupation. All right. Now, in addition to that, in addition to uh, principal private residence, if you let your property to someone, then you will also be able to get something called letting relief. All right? Now it says the principal private residence exemption is extended to gain occurring while the property is let. Now the letting exemption is lower of these three. What is these three? So what first one is forty thousand pounds. Second one is uh, uh, sorry. First one is gain already exempt under PPR. So whatever gain you ha you have got exemption under PPR uh, in the previous treatment. So we'll take that. The second one is gain remaining after PPR. So if there is any still gain remaining after PPR, that one, and the third one is 40,000 pounds. So we'll take lower of these three. So what are first three? Uh, gain claimed under PPR, right? Gain already exempt under PPR. Any gain remaining after claiming PPR. And the third one is 40,000 pounds. So it would be lower of these three, All right? And after that, it says part of the house used exclusively for business purposes. If uh, you had a property and some of the house was used for business purposes, the part of the house used for business purposes, then PPR exemption will not be given to the part of the house used for business purposes. So it will only be uh, available to the part uh, which is uh, for personal use, not for uh, business purposes. All right. Now. If you can, uh, if you can just move down on, on, if you can just go to the next page, it says uh, shares of uh, disposal of shares. All right. 
Now, uh, we were looking at the, uh, at the property now. Till now, we were looking at the property. Now it comes to the shares. You might also have some shares and which you sell and on sale of shares you might get some gain. All right? But the problem arises that uh, it will not be at one single date. Say for example at the start of the, share, uh, start of the year you bought some shares, then you bought some shares after some time. Then you bought some shares after three months, then you bought some shares after six months. So it will be in different, uh, different dates during the year. When you're buying the shares on different dates during the year, then obviously the uh, price of the shares will also be different during the period of, uh, during different dates of the year. Say, for example, if you bought some shares in January, the share price was two pounds, where, whereas when you bought it uh, in September, the share price was six pounds, so it would be different. Likewise, when you are selling the shares, uh, then also the sale price would also be different. Now the problem arises that although when you're selling the shares, you're selling 200 shares, but them 200 shares, were, some of them were shares were bought for two pounds and some of the shares was bought for four pounds, say for example. So although we can take the sales price, but as far as cost is concerned, it is very, very difficult to determine the cost straight away. So there is a way to calculate the cost. How can we do it? Here you go. We will read the share of disposal, yeah, disposal of shares, sorry, <coughs> excuse me. Now, share pool, it says, what is share pool? Consists of all shares purchased before the date of disposal. So, it will be uh, all the shares before you dispose them, it will go into the share pool. Now, two tracks are maintained. One is number of shares, another one is cost. So, how can we do it? We'll do number of shares and we'll take the cost. So, then we will take the average, whatever the average is. When shares are sold, then the cost of the shares in the share pool are apportioned according to the number of shares sold in the pool all right so it will be the pooling after that it says matching rule on sale of shares it is only for individuals remember uh, how can we match it now there are three preferences first one is shares purchased on the same date so when you say for example you sold 300 shares and uh, if you have purchased 100 shares on the same date then you will take 100 shares price first so first price you will take is of same day then the second preference is purchased on the following 30 days so if you have purchased any shares uh, in the following 30 days you will take them shares price in the second preference and the last pre preference would be the share pool where the all the shares in cost would be uh, included all right after that it says right shares you know from your earlier studies uh, in accounting you know what right shares is uh, the right share are added in the previous shares as normal acquisition in the share pool then it says bonus shares now bonus shares are exactly like rights shares but uh, the only difference is that you don't pay anything for bonus shares so although the shares will be increased but the price will remain same and if the price will remain same it means that the shares are increased but the uh, price will become uh, lower the tax in the same way as rights shares except uh, that the bonus share do not have cost and after that, it says a retake, uh, sorry, take or reorganization. It is simply like if you uh, buy a share, if you buy some shares in a company, and that, then that company is took over by another company, and that company, the new company, will give you shares in the new company, and it will take out all the shares of the old, old company. So it is simply that. If the shares are replaced with the new holding, due to reorganization or takeover, the cost of previous shares are a portion to the new holding using the market value of new holding uh, and we uh, will calculate according to the new value all right and after that it says quoted shares gifted now if you buy buy some quoted shares now quoted shares are uh, shares which are quoted into the uh, rec recognized stock exchange now if you have gifted them shares when quoted shares are gifted the sales price sales value or the market value of the for CGT purposes will be lower off if you've gifted some quoted shares, then the market price would be lower of lower of these two. What are these two? Lower quoted price, which will be given to you in the exam, and the higher uh, multi, uh, plus uh, half of higher quoted price less lower quoted price. So it will be given to you in the exam. All of the, these figures will be given to you in the exam. And the second one is highest market bargain uh, plus lowest market bargain divided by two. So it will be average basically. Now, these all stuff will be given to you in the exam 
it, and it will tell you that uh, that many shares have been sold, whereas a uh, market price was that, lowest quoted price was that, highest quoted price was that, and a uh, uh, ma market bargain will also be given to you. All right? Uh, that's it for this lecture, and uh, we've covered almost uh, quite a lot of capital gain stacks. This lecture was exactly the same which you studied at F6. If you're watching for, for F6, uh, then uh, that is new to you. Uh, please make sure you do a lot of practice. And if you're watching it for P6, then it is just a broad forward knowledge uh, and it is assumed knowledge by examiner. So examiner expect you to know it uh, because you've already studied at F6. All right, that's it for this lecture and uh, we'll continue our journey with the capital gain stacks in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye.